Fire on the Mountain, Chapter 1, Part 6. I stayed on the road, since I find these mannerisms ignorant and degrading, not only to the women who must endure them, but to his family and to himself. Of course, since he is my uncle, and I not his, I cannot protest. I happened to hear a clatter from upstairs in the house, and looked up and saw, I suppose it doesn't hurt to tell it now, and to be a true abolitionist such as yourself, a negro in the window, holding not just a rifle, but what I recognized as a new pattern sharps. Alarmed, I looked out for Uncle Reuben, who was getting a frosty welcome from the woman, whose accent was unexpectedly northern. Not to be deterred, he was about to dismount, when the door slams, and out of the house rushes an old colored mammy, a hanky on her head, her aprons flying, cl clucking like a hen, swinging a toe sack. Loudy, massa. She started yelling that he was trampling her, yarbs and narstrums, and boldly grabbing Caesar's bit. She led the horse back out to the road while its rider looked back helplessly, longingly, and fetchingly, I suppose he imagined, toward the lady. I have known Uncle Reuben to whip slaves like an Irishman, but he was too much playing the gallant, even to speak harshly to the old mammy in front of her lady. Plus, he could not trust his horse. By the time I looked back up at the window, the negro with the sharps had gone. I was careful never to say a word of this to anyone, for I figured we'd stumbled across a way station for fugitive slaves. And that was that. Though a way station with armed negroes seemed a sinister thing. Little did I know that I was being planned, that was being planned was a bloody raid in which the innocent would die. Did you know that the first to be murdered at Harper's Ferry was a free colored man? Not a slave, but a citizen of the town? The whole country knows this Osawatomi Brown from Kansas, where he gave abolition a dark name killing five men cold-bloodedly in the swamp of the swan with a sword. At the same, I'm glad to see a blow struck against slavery. To be fair, I must admit that many here in abolitionist circles admire Brown more than will announce or own it. Caesar turned even more skitterish and went lame later that day, and Uncle Reuben swore the old mammy hexed him. We had to sell the horse for half his price and then buy another at twice, for Uncle Reuben's pride will not allow him to seat a plain mount. Some say Brown made the raid to steal guns for Kansas, where he plans a free state empire. Others say he's arming the slaves to massacre whites. As for me... I think violence only makes the Negro situation worse, as well as being foreign to his nature. I appreciated your frank letter and hope to see you again very soon. I sincerely admire your determination to study medicine, but I hardly think Boston will be more friendly to the idea of a female doctor than New York, or even the hidebound South itself. Your friend and future colleague in the cause, Hunter, Philadelphia. Ow, mother, grandma already did that. Hush, sit still, honey. Let your mama fix your hair. No, later, please. I want to watch vid. Yasmin gave up, got a shawl, and went outside, onto the little terrace that opened from the room. It was almost dark. Yasmin didn't usually like to be outside at night, under the stars, but here it was okay. The bulk of the mountain covered half the sky like a comforter pulled up under the eyes, and the clouds took care of the rest. The Shenandoah Inn was almost empty. The hotel keeper had explained that it was late for tourists and that travelers usually stayed in the more modern Bolivar Hotel up the bluff, towards Charlestown, which had a shuttle to the airship hold. It was cold here under the mountain, and Yasmin liked that. Now, again, she could feel the little fire inside her, too small to light or heat anything but itself, not quite a person, but certainly a life. She sat with the old letters on her lap, not reading them, but listening to the river, invisible behind the trees. The yellow poplar leaves shook as if applauding a show she didn't have tickets to. The Shenandoah River sounded cold and rocky and indifferent, not like the muddy, friendly little Caroline rivers that just sort of sat with you. Behind her, she could hear bits and pieces of the news on the vid as Harriet scanned through, then double-clicked on the Mars voyage. 
Why shouldn't she? The ship was named after her father. Yasmin's husband, Leon, had been killed in space five years before, on the return from the first Mars flyby. In Africa this summer, as part of the antiquities team for the Uldavi extension of the Great Rift Expressway, it had seemed especially ironic to Yasmin that she was re relocating the graveyards of people who had tied their children's braids a hundred thousand years before. She was repairing the pots they buried their loved ones with, while the father of her child, the comrade of her days, the lover of her nights, hadn't even left her with a body to bury. The accident, a welding line break, had happened during an EVA, in deep space, in slow motion. The whole world listening across 160 million miles, while Leon, spinning irretrievably away from the ship, assessed the damage for his comrades, outlined the fix, he was a chief engineer, and said farewell. Farewell. Harriet was eight. Leon was so far away that he had already been dead for 14 and a half minutes when he said goodbye to her and Yasmin. It had broken the child's heart, but broken hearts children get over with. It had left Yasmin alone and afraid of the night sky. She couldn't stand to look at the stars. Where was Leon in all that cold splendor? She hated the shroud-like the shroud -like Milky Way, or in Africa, the Southern Cross. She hated the million brilliant stars looking like candles in a graveyard endlessly deep. Of course, she knew it was morbid. For five years, she had never told anyone, not even Harriet, why she stayed inside at night. With Leon gone, there was no one to tell, until last summer. And she had told Natoli, not because they were lovers, she had had lovers, but because he was old enough, in his spirit, to understand. He had that formal Southern African fashion of answering a touch with a story, a story with a touch. In the traditional fishing villages east of the Cape, he said, when a man was lost at sea, his belongings were buried so that the earth would not forget him. His own father was buried so. Harriet scanned the vid down farther. She could tell by the way her mother sat holding her shoulders that she could hear. She clipped through the menu. Land reclamation in Europe was going well. In Timor, they were farming the sea. The lion was in sub Deimos orbit where the crew was programming the great ram wings, preparing to descend. Click, click. Like the cellular memory of a limb that has been lost to evolution, the vid explained, the pseudo wings align and guide the ship in an imitation of flight appropriate for the rarefied air of the red planet. Harriet was still young enough, at 13, to understand remembering something she'd never had. Her father had once told her that gliding was easier the younger you were, because almost everybody remembers how to fly from their baby dreams. As they grow up, they forget. Even, even after he became a space engineer, he loved gliding. Harriet was going to start flying this year, whether her mother liked it or not. The collective would back her up. She punched off the vid and went to the door and looked out onto the terrace. Her mother was asleep with the letters on her lap. Even though she had gotten along fine for the summer, even though she was almost 13, which was almost 15, which was almost 16, Harriet was glad to have her mother back. Even a cranky mother who was afraid of the sky. Harriet covered her with a blanket and took the letters inside to read. She reached down to take her shoes off, then remembered that she couldn't. But she could. They flexed to help her. She stepped back into them, and they put themselves back on. That was neat. But if they were going to get pretty, she wished they would get on with it. Yasmin was dreaming of Leon again. It was the same dream she'd had twice since coming back from Africa. Leon had been, gliding, had been a gliding instructor in college, but he had never asked her to go up, understanding that she hated flying, which was why she'd taken the car from Nova Africa after grinding her teeth for four hours on the triple sonic from Dar. But in the dream, he didn't understand anymore. He was like a stranger. He reached for her, and she pulled away. He didn't look right. He was wearing the spacesuit he wore in the stupid hollow at his mother's house. The one he was wearing right now, 14 and a half minutes ago, up there. I can't go with you, Yasmin said. 
He got smaller when she said it. I can't go with you. He got smaller when she said it. End of part six.